Hey everybody, so I wanted to tackle a question that I've been getting asked a lot ever since my uh, announcing my embrace of Christianity uh, a couple of years ago, and that is, uh, how do I feel looking back, looking back, how do I feel now about my time as a part, uh, in taking part in Satanism and the occult, and um, and, my, and how do I feel about those practices in general now as well? And I thought that's an interesting topic to get into. And what got me thinking about it was that today, um, today being uh, Sunday, the, um, Sunday the 7th, I had the opportunity to see a really great uh, film in theaters, which was uh, called The Most Reluctant Convert. And Mitzi says hi, by the way. Hey, sweetie. It was called The Most Reluctant Convert, and it was a movie about the life, uh, the early life and conversion to Christianity of a uh, one C.S. Lewis. And it's based on uh, a stage play, a uh, one-man stage play called C.S. Lewis on Stage, The Most Reluctant Convert. Uh, it's put out by a company called Fellowship for the Performing Arts, which is a Christian theater company. And this was their first foray into um, a cinematic production, into an actual feature film. And uh, it's it was the movie was really phenomenal. The original stage play was really phenomenal. And it's yeah, I saw the vi a complete live performance video of the stage play when it was on Amazon Prime. And uh, in fact, I got Amazon Prime specifically so that I could see this. And. The stage play meant a lot, really meant a lot to me because it got me out of a, or helped guide me through, I should say, a very severe depression that I was going to, going through around the time that I saw it. So getting to see it really, uh, really spoke to me and really helped me a lot and uh, it was very, very much resonated with me. And Max McLean, who played C.S. Lewis on the stage production and the movie, uh, is actually um, is also the voice of my audio Bible that I have on my phone, so I thought that was really cool. Um, but anyway, Fellowship for the Performing Arts does some really phenomenal stuff. I cannot recommend them enough, and I want to say the best the best recommendation I can give for them, uh, it, the most concise recommendation, is to say they are not pure flicks not pure flicks at all. They are not in the habit of creating, uh, you know, pure, pure flicks, pure flicks fails, fails me on a spiritual level and they fail me on an artistic level. You know, they, they don't make movies. They make framing devices for church sermons. That's all it is. It's, it's a, it's, it's really, it's, they don't make, um, uh, they don't make, uh, artistic endeavors inspired by their Christian faith. They make um, very, very uh, stilted and awkward, um, uh, you know, lectures meant, meant ostensibly to convert people from atheism to Christianity, but really only uh, preaching to the um, evangelical lot that really buys into their uh, particular interpretation of Christianity. So, uh, Fellowship for the Performing Arts is not that, not at all. I saw their stage production of the Screw Tape Letters live, and it was phenomenal. The set design was like something out of a Tim Burton movie. The acting was phenomenal. The there was so much creativity and exploration of the idea and the way they dramatized it, and so much humor. You know, there's like there. I remember one thing that really got a laugh was um, there's a there's a, a moment in the Screw Tape Letters where Screw Tape is ranting about celebrities that are constantly getting onto new. Uh, new trends and new fads and that sort of, you know, that sort of thing. And in the stage production, when Screwtape is talking about that, right as he says that, he sits down in a chair and opens up a Madonna biography, you know, and that gets a great laugh from the crowd. So there's all of this humor and all this creativity and everything going in. Mitzi, I, you're the one that wanted to, you're the one that wanted to be held. It, you got in my, you, you, you're the one keeping this going. Are, are you demonically possessed? Is that what it is? Do we need to do an exorcism? Because if we have to do an exorcism, I'm getting the, the flea shampoo. Weird. Anyway. Um, so, um, they were, uh, you know, they do really cool stuff. And I, I cannot recommend them enough. Uh, just, 
you, 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 it, what's great, really the thing is, what's great about what the, Mitzi, God, good grief, what is, weirdest cat, anyway, uh, what they, um, what they, uh, what they do, it's like, it's not, again, it's not preachy, if you just want to go enjoy a great night at the theater, and see an amazing production, they, um, that you can do that, you know, they're not going to say, come out and say, who wants to get saved, or something like that, they, it's just a good night at the, the cinema, do, celebrating the arts, and the creativity of the source material, they do a lot of C.S. Lewis stuff, they do other stuff too, they did A Man for All Seasons, uh, things like that, so I recommend it. Anyway, moving on from that, the movie, it was great, and I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. What was interesting to me, though, is there is a moment a moment in there that addresses C.S. Lewis's own fascination with the occult, and I thought that was really cool. Not a lot of people talk about that. Not a lot of people know about it. I'm not picking you up again. Um, not a lot of people talk about that. Not a lot of people know about it. But, uh, but yeah, he went through a time when, um, he had the, he had his own fascination with, uh, with the occult. And he even says that in the movie, by the way, the movie and the stage play are both taken verbatim from C.S. Lewis's own writing. So everything you hear Lewis say in the, the movie as part of the narrative is something that was in, you know, Surprised by Joy or The Weight of Glory or any of his other writings. Uh, anyway, but he talks about, he says, like, if someone else had come along at the, if he had, if someone else had gotten a hold of him at the wrong time, he could have ended up being a Satanist. Um, and so I, I thought that was really interesting that he went through this period too. And it got me thinking about what does, um, you know, how, how do I feel about this, my time and, and all of that, and looking back on it now, and how do I feel about the concepts now? And I think there's a great, window into that explanation from Lewis's own writing. So for me at the time, you know, the reason this comes up is because in the early years of my really, I think the first probably two years of my uh, YouTube presence, I um, was heavily, that I got into that at a time when I was heavily into the occult anyway, and then that was motivated all the way into Satanism. And I say that these are reasonably distinct concepts. I'll explain why in a minute. But I was motivated to get into Satanism, I think, in, a, in large part, because I was, I, I was arguing at the time um, against a lot, as an atheist arguing, or a secularist, if you will, or a godless heathen, if you will, against um, the, peop the creationists, the people that wanted, uh, you know, creationism taught in school and were anti-evolution and all of that, um, <clears throat> because I was arguing against them, I couldn't just be satisfied disagreeing with them. I had to, like, there was something in me, a very toxic strain in my personality that made me need to push all the way in the opposite direction. And so if they're creationists, I have to push all the way in the other direction and be a warlock because I've got to, like, move myself as far apart from these people as I possibly can. Uh, I went through two phases with that. One was being interested in... Um, uh, Satanism, and one was being interested in matters of the occult, and ultimately the distinguishing thing is between the occult being a theistic practice and Satanism as it's codified and understood by Anton LaVey as being uh, a secular, atheistic practice. So <clears throat> occultists like the Thelemites, which I got involved with, and the Aleister Crowley bunch and all of that, uh, they really do believe that they are in contact with, um, you know, extra-dimensional beings that uh, that through through ritual they are actually having contact with, whereas Satanists uh, under Levey and under the Levean tradition do not actually believe in that. They uh, <clears throat> are an atheist secular religion that practices things like ritual and uh, ritual and religious services and that sort of thing more as theater for the psychological benefit and enjoyment of the people involved. And so, you know, I got into the occult, and I got fascinated with Aleister Crowley, and what happened was a friend of mine gave me a copy of The Equinox. Uh, we were supposed to work on a musical project uh, of his... <clears throat> 
that uh, one, it was going to involve a lot of Thelemic commentary and everything, and um, the uh, and so he gave me a copy of the Equinox to read up on what we were doing, and uh, I I read that, and the Equinox contained a copy of the Book of the Law, and I read that, and it really did speak to me. And I will give Crowley credit where Crowley, where uh, credit is due. He was a stylist par excellence. And he knew how to write a good, you know, knew how to spin a good yarn. He had wonderful, beautiful prose, and it was very captivating. And I don't say that to be condescending at all. That really, I, I really do uh, think that even to this day, the writing was good, and the writing spoke to me. Um, and, but the thing was, and this is where it ties back into C.S. Lewis, um, in the movie and the stage play and the original writing where it's sourced from, Lewis talks about how. Uh, the occult aroused in him not spiritual love, but spiritual lust. And I think that really cap captures where, where I was because there was a spirituality to it and there was a, a, a component of wanting to be in touch with the divine, but it was a very shallow kind of primal indulgence. And, and, and it, was, it was very shallow in terms of what it aimed to accomplish. And I felt like uh, neither in Thelema or in Satanism was I finding that really rich uh, kind of wellspring of, um, of philosophical, emotional, spiritual um, development that I was really looking for. Um, so it was just ultimately unsatisfying, and I left all of that behind just in favor of atheism long, you know, more than more than a decade, close to 15 years before I ever considered returning to Christianity. And uh, lost interest in the uh, lost interest in the occult. Um, really, Crowley is not. Uh, the, to, an honest appraisal of Crowley is to say that he was neither as good or as evil as his uh, followers or detractors like to make him out to be. The best compendium of knowledge, if you really want to know Crowley, um, I recommend this book, Perturabo, by Richard Kaczynski. It is easily the most authoritative and uh, deep and authoritative uh, guide to Aleister Crowley. The only thing, the only criticism of it I have really is that a lot of his encounters with demons and spirits and that sort of thing are presented as purely factual. Like it says Crowley had this, you know, said this to this demon and it said this, like they had a back and forth and it doesn't put any kind of skepticism on that or, or anything at all. Uh, so that's a little odd, but, um, as far as just a thorough body of knowledge on Crowley, this book is really it. And what's interesting about that is, honestly, you read that book, and it's, like I said, it's neither, he's neither as good or as evil. He really just comes off as, um, the, the most honest thing you can say about him is that he's somebody that had a lot of potential. He was very skilled in a lot of areas. Um, but, uh, you know, he was a good writer, he was a good chess player, he was a good mountain climber, he was, a good, he was, he was a very much had the potential to be a renaissance man, but he never really had the discipline or the self-awareness and introspection and self-knowledge necessary to really uh, capitalize on those things and develop those, those skills. He, um, he just kind of seems like uh, his life really comes off as like the ultimate study in wasted potential. And uh, so that's th that reading that um, is, is a very sobering critique of Crowley. And I think that's the best way to um, that really is the best way to kind of um, kind of purge one's interest in Crowley because obviously, it, uh, I can speak from experience when I say that if you try to tell someone you shouldn't be in, into Aleister Crowley, he was vile and evil, well, that just increases the appeal. So really, it's demystifying the man and getting more to the reality that really does it. Um, and then, you know, with, with Satanism, it just so petered out with me to the point that um, I, I would have people like messaging me, asking for satanic advice about things, and I would be like, Oh yeah, I'm I'm into that, right? Yeah, uh, here here's an answer, and it really it was not a part of my life anymore. So by the time I came out and said I wasn't into it, 
anymore. It just really didn't, I hadn't had any interest in it in a while at all. And it just, it was no great conversion. It just sort of petered out because there's really not a lot there. It's kind of like the philosophy is, uh, it's a philosophy that says you can live your life however you want. Well, I don't need a philosophy that tells me I can live my life however I want. I can, if, if, if I want to do that, I'll just live my life however I want, you know? So it's just kind of a, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of like, I think about, I think it's kind of like the thing, there's a Homestar Runner cartoon where Homestar is uh, trick-or-treating and he gets he gets a, a handful of coins, you know, like loose change in his um, Halloween bucket. And he says, oh, okay, well, I guess I can, I guess I can take this money and go buy candy from the store. So thank you for adding this extra step to my, uh, pro to the process. And that's really what it feels like with Satanism. It's like, it's an unnecessary thing. Like you want to live, you want to do whatever you want, do whatever you want. Uh, the only, in retrospect, so I was never a member of the Church of Satan. Even then, I had real misgivings about how the church was being run. And uh, and and to this day, I still, you know, I, I still wouldn't agree with how it's being run. I just don't care anymore because I'm not interested in it. But um, <clears throat> I had some <clears throat> disagreements with how it was being run. And so I was a, an honorary member of a... Um, uh, a group that kind of maintained the Levian tradition, uh, which was called the Worldwide Church of Satanic Liberation, uh, which was uh, uh, this thing started by this guy, Paul Valentine. And Paul was like, I mean, in retrospect, I, and I, it's, from what I understand, he actually died recently. And, um, that, and, and uh, my condolences to his family, if they should see this, I haven't been able to get a lot of confirmation on it, but that rumor's been going around, and uh, or that that people have been talking about that online. Um, but it was interesting for you know Paul was a a it was not always nice to me was nice to me for a long time, and we would talk a lot on the phone, and he was very much uh, a friend a friend and a. Uh, and I, I will even say a uh, at times a very positive mentoring presence in my life during that time, but the weirdest thing happened um, one time one day on in a in some December somewhere um, I me and some friends were on Facebook talking about how instead of Christmas that year we were going to um, celebrate Festivus, which Seinfeld notwithstanding actually is a real holiday, and. So we were going to celebrate Festivus, and Paul saw that and, like, got really angry at me for not celebrating Christmas and um, canceled my membership in the Worldwide Church of Satanic Liberation because of it and never had any contact with me again. And I thought it was the most bizarre, r surreal, ridiculous thing. And that was another thing that came after I had lost interest in Satanism anyway. So I, he probably realized that I was not, you know interested in, in it anymore anyway. But it was so funny, and that's why I always, you know, if you ever play that game where it's like, uh, you know, tell four true things about yourself and one lie, uh, one of the true things I include is that I once got kicked out of a satanic church for refusing to celebrate Christmas. Um, anyway, so that's this bizarre thing, uh, bizarre aside. But um, Looking back on it now, I think the question that a lot of people would have... Now, the thing is about Satanism, um, being touting yourself as a Satanist and being a Satanist, to be honest, most people outside of the outside of Satanism don't take it that seriously, and that includes most Christians. Like, you may be... If you want to set yourself up as a Satanist, you may be able to find a... Um, uh, you may be able to find some extreme right-wing evangelical type, like a Rod Parsley type person that will give you the reaction you're hoping for of like, ah, you're a warlock, you're vile, you're evil, you know, all of that stuff. The power of Christ compels you, all that stuff. But most people don't have that reaction. Most people just think you're being a jackass and that's it. Um, I'm sure one question people would ask would be, what do I think of the, uh, the satanic temple or the, is it the, Temple of Satan or the Satanic Temple um, is the one that's now like a social activist group. Um, <laughs> the um, 
I, I guess you could say I agree that there will be times where like my political positions agree with their political positions. Like I still don't, I still don't believe that religious iconography should be on uh, government property, for example, uh, things like that. So like, I mean, I guess you could say I, um, you know, I, I guess you could say there will be times when our political views overlap. And I certainly, the, um, you know, I, I, I certainly, uh, given that I still practice a very liberal, um, I still, I, I have very liberal views in my own right and have no problem with, you know, I'm pro-gay marriage and that sort of thing. Um, you know, for that reason, I can see the humor in, you know, having, you know, the things they do, like having uh, gay sex on the property of um, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church and all that. You know, I mean, there's a certain punk rock appeal to that. Uh, that said, I I don't have any real interest in them, uh, per se. I mean, that's not, it's just not, it's just not interesting. And that's the thing. Um, I think people are maybe wondering, like, if I'm going to be inching back towards or inching my way towards some extreme evangelical perspective, and I'm really not, um, I'm just, uh, that, that is not, it's, it's very much a quiet, personal Thing that I wanted to do, and that's why I resist the urge to talk about spirituality as much as people tend to enjoy these types of videos. I don't want to be one of these people that would, call, you know, be so pretentious as to call their YouTube channel a ministry, or to, um, I, I really, actually, you know, I don't even want to put, I don't want to even, even want to call those people pretentious, because there are people who legitimately are practicing ministries on YouTube. Um, but, but yeah, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to dress it up in any high, you know, what I do up in any highfalutin language that makes it sound more important or dignified than it actually is. Let me put it that way. So it's, it's just a very private, personal thing. And as I look back on all of that stuff, I, I keep coming back to that observation about spiritual lust, that it's just not, it's, it, it appeals to, it, it, it and I think that's a, an apt metaphor because like it's appealing on a primal level. But if you're looking for something really positive uh, that's really going to evolve you and develop you as a person, I really can't, um, I, I, there's just not anything there. The only, um, the only left-hand path organization that I could say I really have any respect for at this point would be the um, Temple of Set. And the reason for that is not out of any kind of necessarily any agreement with them or anything like that, but just that they are very clear, they have a very high turnover rate, and they're very clear that, like, it's something that's only going to appeal to you for a particular amount of time in your life. Like, this is a phase you're going through, and you will leave this, you will move on from it. So their willingness to say that and acknowledge that, I think, um, is something that I can commend, because it really is, honestly... You know the the um, uh, the number of people that really stay with that sort of thing into their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. It's relatively low. It's something that gets you at a certain time in your life, and then you really do grow out of it. So, I think that's an accurate and apt understanding, and I commend them for um, for being honest in that way. Um, you know, as far as, like, I've, I've been a big fan of a lot of satanic musicians um, in the past, uh, and those those fandoms uh, still, my fandom for those still endures. You know, I, I love the music and uh, the music and artistry of Boyd Rice. Uh, I love the music and artistry of Nicholas Schreck, even though he and Boyd would not be, are not uh, friends anymore, to, you know, say it as an understatement. Um <laughs> Uh, to make an understatement, but, you know, there, I like their stuff. I, you know, I'm a diehard metalhead. I love King Diamond. And so all of that, um, you know, I, you can appreciate, I think you can appreciate things on an artistic level without having to put your own spiritual energy into, um, the iconography that they use and that sort of thing. I will still, like I referenced in the last Axis of Empires album, um, or the most recent Axis of Empires album, uh, um, Awakened by Chaos, I made a reference to, uh, I made a reference in some of my lyrics to New Eaton Hadith, um, among other mythological figures that I was discussing in that song and throughout the album, because I use all types of 
mythology in my writing, and that happened, New Eaton Hot Eat happened to be a good symbol, a good representation for what I was trying to describe in that song. So, you know, from a mythological standpoint, I don't have a problem using these characters to represent things archetypally, symbolically, metaphorically. Um, it's just not it's just not where I find my real spiritual sustenance and spiritual nourishment. Um, I had an experience which, without being too tantalizing, I prefer not to talk about, but it was a very personal um, spiritual experience for me that really made me aware of God's presence in a way that I had never experienced before, and that happened back in 2017. And so I... Um, I, I was, uh, you know, because of that, um, I, you know, I felt a, a deeper pull towards the Christian ethos, the, and my, my life has slowly and steadily improved in, dramatically in a lot of ways as I have gone down that road in a way that it never has before in any of the other things that I've pursued. So that's the path I'm on. I'm not afraid of the imagery or iconography of, um, you know, religious systems that I might have participated in the past, participated in in the past or anything. Um, I just I don't view them as having any power. Um, like I said, I I don't mind using them to describe metaphorical ideas or to get a point across, but I don't view them as having any real spiritual power. And um, it's uh, it, it, it's just um, it, it just feels like any real meaning, any any depth of meaning that those things could have for me, uh, just isn't there anymore. I still like dark, spooky, scary stuff. You know, I still like the paintings of H.R. Geiger and Bekshinsky and all of these people. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, um, I saw that Pan's Labyrinth just became available on Netflix. It's a phenomenal movie. I want to see it again um, uh, now that it's available. You know, that kind of thing. That, that's all still there. It's just not, um, it, it's just not where I'm looking for my spirituality. And I think that's something that is, confu is probably confusing and surprising to a lot of people is uh, I'm I'm still not one of these people that is like, you know, oh, we need to cast aside all of the horrible, sinful things of this world or anything. I feel like if you're living in that mindset, I feel like you're really spiritually lacking because it's kind of, think about it this way. It's kind of like if you're an alcoholic and you go without having a drink for 10 years because, or, or for the rest of your life, because you're stranded on a desert island where there is no alcohol, that's not overcoming your alcoholism. Overcoming your alcoholism is when you can go sit down in a bar with your friends, and they all order beers, and you order a Diet Coke. You know, that's when you can just sit there and have a good time and not get drunk, even though you're surrounded by alcohol. That's when you've, when you're, when you've overcome your alcoholism. And by the same token, I don't think that living in uh, seething chronic fear of occult imagery or anything like that is, um, I don't think that that's good spirit, spiritual development. I think good spiritual development is just, this is, where, this is where I get my spirituality, this is what resonates with me, uh, the rest of it just doesn't mean very much to me. So that's my attitude, and I will close saying this. I think the best way, you know, the big, the next question, the final question on all of that is, where do you stand on the mythology around Satan? And <clears throat> even as a, uh, a Christian, I, I, I shudder to use that expression simply because I believe that if you're going to be a Christian, you should be confirmed into a church, and I am not yet. I want to confirm into the Episcopal Church. But for all intents and purposes, uh, it will use it will work for the discussion we're having. Um, but um, the question becomes: the question arises. You know, what do you think about the mythological archetypal meaning of Satan? And <clears throat> you know, 
Satan in Satanism is reimagined as a very kind of Promethean deity, that it's, it's about stealing the wisdom and enlightenment and knowledge from the gods that have tried to keep you, uh, keep you down and keep you dormant and all of that. And um, think about it this way. Like, when I was way into that, I, lo I loved the image of Satan as the ultimate rebel, this headstrong badass that was going to play by his own rules and not let anyone tell him what to do. And once I fully embraced a Christian ethos, my perspective on um, my perspective on Satan changed dramatically. And it's kind of like if you read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Spoiler alert. Um, you know, throughout the book, Wormwood, the apprentice devil, is uh, trying to tempt this man's soul into hell. And when the man finally dies, he is able to see Wormwood for what he is. And uh, because he because he has uh, he has been saved, his soul is going um, his soul is going to join uh, the heavenly host and all of that. He's able to see Wormwood for what he really is. And Wormwood, this demon that all of his life has been trying to tempt his soul into perdition and tempt him into hell and all of that, he is, um, uh, he realizes that it's really just this kind of pathetic, wormy little thing. That Wormwood was the, a joke all along, was a loser. And that's the thing. It's not. The change of perspective is that Satan goes from seeming like this awesome, headstrong, badass rebel to more like the kid in school that's like the wormy goth kid no one wants to hang out with. So he starts talking about how he's an individualist and not a conformist. He doesn't want to hang out with all you conformist people. You know, and, and when, when really all he's doing is covering up for the fact that nobody likes him and no one wants anything to do with him. That's the the difference. That's the change in perspective. Um, it it um, he, he goes from he goes from seeming like uh, Satan goes from seeming like Lord Voldemort to seeming like a a teenage Severus Snape, you know, and um, and that's uh, that's the real change. And so anyway, I hope that was interesting for people. I hope that answers some questions. Um, I don't do I look back on my time in the occult with great regret or anything. I look back on it as time wasted. Uh, it was time that I could have spent, you know, I could have put towards more productive uh, things that would have been more fulfilling in the long term. Uh, I grew as a person ultimately in, uh, in recognizing, you know, recognizing that as an aspect of my you know, my many, re looking at the, looking at the toxic parts of my nature that that was exploiting and realizing that. So I ultimately grew in the long term, but, um, as far as, you know, yeah, my main regret is just that it was a waste of time. Um, did, you know, did I, when I converted, did I offer any, uh, particular apologies to God for being a part of that? Um, not, exactly not really i think just because when you fundamentally convert to christianity you are acknowledging to god that you've been fundamentally living your life the wrong way all along and so everything is kind of consumed in that um i i so i i feel i feel personally like um i i'm now on the right track or trying to be on the right track and um to my friends who are, you know, I, being in, you know, being in the heavy metal community and the artistic community and all of that, I have a lot of friends that are still into that, into the occult and witchcraft and all that stuff and everything. And uh, to them, I would say, you know, as always, you, you have to live your life and do what you think is best. I will never tell you or anybody that you're going to hell because that is not my job. Uh, it is absolutely not my right to make that judgment. I do not know the mind of God. I will, so I will never tell anyone that they're going to hell. Uh, what I will say is, this is what has worked for me. This is what's helping me. And um, if you're at a point in your life where you feel like you need to embrace uh, spirituality, this, and you want my advice, this is the road I would tell you to go down. So anyway, uh, I hope that answers the question. It was interesting to talk about, and I'll catch everybody next time.